Okay, so I think we can uh, go to the next and last talk of, of this session of today. Uh, so which is from uh, Ravi Rao, uh, who is professor at Louisiana State University in the United States. Um, so yes, I see that. Uh, Yes, you started sharing. Yeah. So, can you Green, hear me? Right. Yes. Uh, yes. Can you just try to make full screen, or because otherwise you might okay. not be able to. How about now? See all the details. Uh, yeah, but I see a white screen. Is it? Is it? Uh, Yes, the first first one is a oh, white screen. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, uh, shall I begin? Yes, yes. Thank please. you. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for this very interesting workshop and for inviting me to participate in it. And uh, it was a privilege to hear this morning and see on the screen two of the principles of this paper 60 years ago that is being celebrated, uh, Dr. Matthews and uh, J.R. Rao, and also to see Ashok Sudarshan and Professor Bhamati, and hear the very nice summary tribute from Professor Bhamati. I also want to start with a, a tribute to Professor Sudarshan, whom I knew quite well, both personally and professionally. I visited him and his family, stayed at their house in Austin, and met him on many occasions at meetings, mostly in India, and uh, had lots of discussions. And as always, one was struck by the breadth and depth of his thinking, and often a very unique perspective he would have on a topic, again, physics-wise and otherwise. So it is indeed an honor and a privilege to be included in this workshop. So I'm going to talk about constructing solutions for these time-dependent equations, including the ones for open systems with dissipation, where my work sort of touches on the two important papers that have already been mentioned, the 60-year one that we are celebrating and the GKLS, which was mentioned also this morning. And I will, of course, talk about both of them. And the idea of this, uh, theme, it's actually very simple, is that when you have a finite system, which was also the topic that uh, the 1961 paper starts with, and then you have an N-level system, then there is a very nice and simple way of solving the time-dependent operator equations that are involved. So this is a method that we call unitary integration and in fact, the context, of course, is say the Schrodinger equation, the first equations are precisely the first equations in the 1961 paper, for instance. And as one knows, when you're involved with operators within H, which don't commute, then you cannot simply exponentiate to get the time evolution operator U, but you have to do some kind of time ordering, Dyson series, and these are all very familiar. But the idea we followed was very simple, that if you have a finite system and a finite number of operators, which all close in a Lie algebra, then I can always write the U of T as simply a product of exponentials in each of those, which I call A. So, so the different A's that that are involved, you put them in the exponent with some coefficient. And of course, if you're thinking of a Hermitian Hamiltonian, you expect a unitary evolution. So I put this minus i's. And then the point is that all you really need is to engineer a construction. In fact, the word engineering was used earlier today. And in many ways, our approach is very simple. You could actually call it a kind of engineer's approach. So I want to solve this equation. And I say that I'll choose a U like this, and at this moment, I leave these mu's undefined. And this is a 
method that we have been looking at for the last 25 years, starting with my collaborator, Uni Krishnan. And almost at the same time, two others, Shadwick and Buell, also came across the same thing, also for numerical scheme. Because the idea is that in this way, you can take finite time steps in a numerical calculation and still have unitarity preserved throughout. Now, as happens many times, and you will see this theme again in my talk today, uh, this method has been reinvented, so to say, or rediscovered independently many times. And the earliest that I was able to trace back later was in this paper of Y and Norman, which also goes back almost 60 years. And let me illustrate this in a very simple way. So take, for instance, an N-level system, which you can think of equivalently in spin terms as a spin J. And if you have it in a magnetic field, for instance, and a typical magnetic moment dotted into magnetic field coupling. So let's say that is my Hamiltonian. And then I could always say that U of T is a product of three exponentials. In, if you use Cartesian terms, you would have Jx, Jy, and Jz. And the point is that the Lie algebra of them closes. So all the commutators keep going back within themselves. So if I take my U of T and I were to put three exponentials like that, now you will see that I will not use Jx and Jy. I'll mention in a minute why. But if you were to do this, you could do this equally well with Jx and Jy. Then what you will see is that you will get a, for instance, when you take the dot on this U, the time derivative, and say it operates on this, it's going to bring down the mu dot of the minus with the J minus. And now, of course, this operator is sitting in between the other exponentials, but then that is easy. I can always move it to the left by using the standard identity that we are all familiar with. And you get a whole series of nested commutators, but if all of these are a closed finite system, then the point is that I can always do this, however many operations it takes, and rearrange this whole expression in the form of h times u, and therefore identified with the h of interest. Now, this, of course, you will recognize is what we do in ordinary three-dimensional rotations already in classical terms. And this would, of course, give me highly nonlinear equations because the jx, jy, jz commutations keep going on, so you get sines and cosines in these mu plus, mu minus, and mu z. And so these are highly nonlinear Euler equations of rotation. Now, the interesting thing is that if instead I were to put j plus and j minus, still keep jz, but j plus and j minus as the uh, linear combinations of the Cartesian operators, then the thing simplifies. And the simplification, let me illustrate for the spin a half, the simplest two by two, two level system with SU2, where you have the three Pauli spinners. And so now I put a sigma plus, a sigma minus, and a sigma Z. I still have put them in this form, but of course now individually, each of these factors is not unitary. But the point is if the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, you will see that by construction, the total U that you will construct will indeed be unitary. And the Simplification now, in terms of the Euler one I just mentioned, is that the equations for these numbers now, z of t, w, and mu, which are all now in general complex, are much simpler. For instance, the z obeys a simple quadratically nonlinear equation, the Riccati equation. And these are the various elements of the two by two matrix, and they may carry time dependencies. And once you solve that equation by itself, and incidentally, the initial condition is very straightforward. The z's and the w's and mu's at time zero are zero. So that u starts as the unit uh, operator. And then once you have this first one solved, then of course you can put it in here. And these are two simple first order time dependent equations which you can solve. And indeed, as I said, that unitarity is actually as assured by construction. And that means that there'll be connections between the three numbers here, complex numbers. So they're really not six independent things. There are after all only three independent quantities in an SU2 problem. And indeed W is almost the same as the complex conjugate of Z. There's a certain renormalization factor involved. And similarly, the imaginary part of this mu 
is also fixed in terms of z. So ultimately, there are only three quantities, a complex number z and the real part of this mu. And so those would characterize the SU2 problem. Now, before I turn to open systems, let me just complete this by showing you how this relates, of course, to some things which we are familiar with in other ways. And that is that when I'm solving such a spin a half problem, a two level problem, then of course, I will have this complex number Z. I can think of it as inverse stereographically projected onto the block sphere. And then there's the real mu. So the real block equation, the block equation, of course, defines the, I'm sorry, again, I think I lost my cursor. So the block equation, which is for this vector, unit vector on the block sphere is supplemented. So there are two parameters defining my S2 sphere, but then at each point on the sphere, there's a U1 phase. So this is actually what one would call a bundle with a base, which is the S2 uh, sphere uh, base and the fiber, which is a U1 phase. And those are the three parameters of the SU2 problem. Now, now let's turn to open systems. And when you have open systems and the famous GKLS equation, which we have heard about already today, and in this very nice talk by Dr. Pascasio, incidentally, I must point to their paper, and this is a fairly easy way of accessing it. It's a very nice history and well-written about the origins of the various contributions and the various aspects of this so-called GKLS equation, which is the second paper besides the 61 paper that uh, we will be commemorating, so to say, in my talk. And the first part of it is, of course, the usual one in a Hermitian and a closed system case. And this is what is often called the Liouville von Neumann block uh, representation. Um, and then there is the added piece which is really not a time dependent or anything. This is simply a map, the so-called Krauss map or the Krauss SMR as was referred to this morning map, which has this very characteristic structure of an L dagger L with the row and then the other side, and then this famous minus two with that coefficient two, which is sometimes called a jump term. If I have time at the end, I'll come back to that uh, language as well. So this is the famous work of uh, Lindblad and independently, Gorini, Kosakowski, and Sudarshan in 1976 that we have talked about in this workshop. And as was said, there are precursors to this. So Steinspring and Choi, for instance, already had some aspects of this. And Krauss, 1971, was already mentioned. And as I said, I really recommend strongly this very nice historical review of this work. Now, actually, if you think about it and you look back now, again, in terms of independent discoveries and sort of more things seen into an equation later on, uh, actually, there are precursors even further back. For instance, the famous reviews of modern physics of Fano, incidentally, Ugo Fano was my doctoral father, uh, already has uh, an essential aspect of this, though again, perhaps thought, not thought in terms of positivity and uh, um, uh, and block positivity or uh, complete positivity and the distinctions between them, which are now very interesting in the field of quantum information. But uh, from Fano himself, who, from whom I always heard this referred to as the Liouville von Neumann block, uh, he often referred to other statistical physicists like Swansig or Wansness and block whenever he thought in terms of open systems and how these things generalize. And, as I think has also been said elsewhere, Landau already in 1927 had pretty much a structure very similar to this so-called Krauss SMR structure, which is added to make the GKLS equation. Now, my interest in this is the following. And in fact, I arrived at this again in very simple terms. And the point was that so long as I had a structure like just the first part here, as I had in the previous slide, I could always use my Baker Campbell Hausdorff to move all the operators to one side of the row. But the problem now with an equation of this kind is that the row is sitting in between operators in this jump term. 
And so now the question is, how do you handle a situation of that kind? And then in very simple terms, in fact, let me give you the context in which we thought at that time, that if you take again the two level system, the point is that there are only three elements of the density matrix. With the trace fixed at one, you can have the difference between the two diagonal elements and you have the two off diagonal elements if you want, you can take them in these Hermitian uh, combinations. And then the point is that whatever the structure of these equations, and again here, in some ways this may bear on why, for instance, the 61 paper did not anticipate the 10 year later work of Krauss and of complete positivity. The point is that you can always think of this two by two problem with dissipation, decoherence, general, whether it's symmetric, PT symmetric, whatever generalizations you may make, there are only three functions of the density matrix. And so I can always write it, I think as Dr. Lakshmi Narayan called this, this is the row major vectorization. And so if you do that, then of course the equation is again of the same form that I'm looking for, where I, all the operators sit on one side of the density matrix, as in this uh, line here. Can you see my cursor without my going to the pen? I yes. don't know whether my cursor- yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes, you do. Okay. So, and incidentally, it's interesting that I called it a script L at that time. I was thinking most, mostly of you will again, but using a script. And the same thing occurred in Pascasio's um, lecture this morning. And I really didn't have anything else in mind, but even the notation in some ways, as I said, we arrived at it without really worrying about any of these. In fact, I was not aware of all these subtleties about complete positivity at that time. And I was just getting into this field. I had trained in atomic physics and I was getting into this quantum information. But, but the point, of course, as I said, is that any arbitrary master equation of that kind, um, even beyond the GKLS, for instance, you could say that once you think in terms like this, then again, I have the same story that I can put a number of exponentials. If I include the complete Lie algebra that is satisfied, now, of course, I have n squared minus one times n squared minus one as my SU and not the SUN of the original n by n system that I started with. But in terms of this larger SU, then indeed I have again the same story that if I have a finite Lie algebra, then I can write the solution in a closed form. And, and uh, now let me talk a little bit about the two qubit system or the four level system. And the point here is that often these larger SU groups, even though at first sight you might think they're unwieldy, they have many subgroups. And so that's going to be the other theme that I will talk about a little. And let me give you a feel for how, for instance, I can construct the U operator, the evolution in time for any H, this may or may not be remission. And I think of it as divided into blocks, into a two by two matrix of blocks. So I introduce an arbitrary little n, smaller than capital N, of course. And then I say that this H is of this two by two form. And therefore I can seek a solution of U also as a product of three factors. The first one is actually a product of two functions which have the same structure that I'll point to in a minute in the next slide. And then the third one will be block diagonal. So just like the sigma z is diagonal, the only diagonal operator in the spin and half problem, I can always reduce it then to a third factor, which is of smaller su n minus n and su n, and these could be then solved in the next step. And the complex number z that has been introduced here, and it's conjugate, basically it's conjugate. Now these are of course matrices, but they obey again the same matrix Riccati equations. The highest nonlinearity is quadratic. So that is the simplification you get by going to these idempotent structures. And let me just give this to you pictorially. So the idea is actually extremely simple. Take the SU2 as your model, where you write it as a sigma plus, which means there's a zero here, and then there's a sigma z. Yes, and then there is a Z, which you can then think of as the block sphere. And this is the conjugate. And then there is the Sigma Z, which is diagonal. And that's the U1 phase. 
Now the idea is that for any other SU, large n or n squared, you again construct a product of three, but now each of these is a block matrix, unit matrix, and one non-zero block here, one non-zero block here, and the last one is block diagonal of lower dimensions. So in a way, you can bootstrap your way along from the capital N or N squared and come down to smaller and smaller ones. So you have a generalized base and the fiber. And let me just give you the uh, picture of how this comes about in the case of the two uh, qubit, uh, which is a 15 parameter problem in principle. So again, yes. Uh, so the full SU4 would actually have four complex Zs, but there are smaller subgroups, which may be of interest in the particular physics problem that you're interested in. There are many SU3 groups. There are SU2 cross SU2. There's a very interesting subgroup of seven parameters. And then there is the SO5 of 10 parameters. And to identify this, since we are using only the commutators in that Baker Campbell Hausdorff, here's a set of the commutators of all the 15 operators, for instance. And what you will see immediately is that in any row, there are seven zeros, which means that each of these operators has six others that it commutes. And therefore, you will stay within that family of seven if your Hamiltonian also is built out of only those seven. And similarly, there are other things here, sets of 10, which would be the 10 operators for the SO5 subgroup. And there are many, many different ones within any one of these. And so this is the other theme that we have used a lot for simplifying the problems of these higher SU and constructing these manifolds. And again, I'll just give you a picture. For instance, the SO5 subgroup for the two qubit problem finally can be thought of in terms of a base manifold, which is a four sphere, S4. And at each point on that base, there is a six dimensional manifold now. So the fiber is not just a single phase, a spike as I had in my previous diagram, but now this is this fully spiked SU2 sphere. So two SU2s sitting on each point of the base manifold. So there are in all four parameters here, three and three, six, for the full 10 parameters of the SO5. And here's the contrast. So of course it's a more complicated manifold and the geometry is of course a little more involved, but in some ways it's a very simple generalization of our familiar bundle of base S2 and fiber to a more complicated base, just a higher S4 and a fiber now, which is itself many dimensional. Now, there are other aspects of this problem, which I will only mention just uh, for those interested to follow up. I mentioned this very interesting subgroup of SU2 cross U1 cross SU2 of seven parameters. And that has many other connections to things in uh, other areas of mathematics, particularly finite projective geometries. So the finite projective geometry, which is called PG2 comma two is exactly represented by this diagram and this would be the diagram in which the seven operators would sit. And these would be the commutation relationships that I've shown here. And all of this can be read off. And you can almost handle this in the same geometrical terms as we handle the IJK or the sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z triplet. And incidentally, this particular diagram is known very well, in, as I said, in other branches as the Fano plane. This is actually named for Gino Fano, who was Ugo Fano's father and a very well-known geometer of his time, a contemporary of Felix Klein and other great geometers of that time. Um, so let me just mention uh, that there are states which can be similarly discussed for the two by two or the four by four matrix for the two qubit problem. And there are a two recent papers in which you can get more details of both the geometry and symmetry aspects of this problem. Um, and this is simply to show at the end, before I conclude, that uh, we can, of course, do going back to this spin a half for two level problem with dissipation or decoherence. So you can, in fact, solve this. Um, I think maybe I will go to it because I seem to be missing the, the lower part of this. Ah, 
well, anyway, I'm cutting off on the, on the bottom, but it's not very important. There is a word entropy here. This is to show that you can do the three by three matrix that you now have for an open system of a two level system, either completely, that is by using an eight by eight or an SU uh, um, uh, N squared minus one for this particular case, or you can do a, a somewhat simplified form in which you can actually use just the original n by n, and this is simply to contrast. And then, of course, there are all kinds of oscillations in the off-diagonal, the coherence terms of the density matrix, but the entropy, for instance, is monotonically increasing. In this case, it's going to the mixed, completely mixed state, half and half of the density matrix at the end. So in any case, let me conclude, um, and so that we can have time for some questions. Uh, by saying that this unitary integration method is one which is very general, certainly applies in any finite system and uh, uh, touches, of course, on the two famous papers that we have been discussing in this workshop. But in many contexts, it may be a thing which is of use for uh, finite algebras, finite closed algebras, so that you can use this for that system. Okay, I'm somehow not escaping. Uh, now I am. So with that, I will stop and uh, have discussions. Thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, I see, yeah, we all have a question from uh, Mark. I can ask you a question. Hey, Ravi, uh, this is Mark Weldy. Yeah. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm wondering, you know, there's a big field, uh, subfield of quantum computing called Hamiltonian simulation, where people are, you know, interested in simulating other physical systems by means yes. of a quantum computer. Yes. And so I'm wondering if you've thought about how your work in these decompositions intersects with that field. I would think there would be applications there, especially for the time dependent Hamiltonians that you're right. working on. Yeah, very interesting question, Mark. And uh, I'm sure, in fact, there may be others who may want to uh, pipe in who may know better, but you're quite right that um, I think that there may be context um, in that's the original Feynman idea of why I have quantum computers to do these simulations of quantum systems. So you mock the problem by something else um, and uh, see if you can solve it. And certainly I think the technique that I have, as I said, is very simple, but really quite applicable, it seems to me that in very wide context, so it may be very worth looking at it. Thanks for the idea. Okay. Okay, well, yes, there's a question from Carol, you please. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the talk. In fact, the short comment, I'm very pleased to see the famous Fano plane. And then yes. I will only mention that his son, Ugo, has also enormous contributions to physics. And there's this final form of a bipartite state. To make a connection to our paper, this you can take the bipartite state and then using the choi yanukovsky isomorphism, treat it as a quantum operation. And then with this realignment operation, you get back the dynamical matrix, which was discussed in the paper we celebrate. Very interesting. Yeah, incidentally, this Fano form of the bipartite, it's not always referred to it. And what is interesting is I had something like 30, 40 years of close contact with uh, Ugo Fano, but he uh -huh. never made any mention that it was uh -huh. a form that, but of course you're right that it's in his 57 reviews of modern yes. physics. Yes. Thank you and thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. Okay, there's one more question from uh, Usha, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Rao. It is a very interesting talk. Uh, I was thinking that you have given a kind of a dynamical uh, map-like situation with a three cross three matrix form here, mm. but there are also other uh, geometrical representations of our uh, two qubit states as a ellipsoid inscribed inside a block sphere. Right. I was wondering if there are any parameters which are not important for quantum correlations which can be, get hidden and one would be able to represent it in a single block sphere, inside a block sphere, 
have you thought about it this is uh, what i uh, wanted to ask well it's first of all it's very nice to to see you dr usha devi and thanks for the question uh yes um actually however i don't think that will be a simple picture because for instance the two qubit problem is a 15 parameter problem and if you look at the general manifold for that we have discussed it in our paper it's a very complicated grassmannian manifold so i doubt that it will be just one block sphere sitting in another block sphere but for smaller systems where our system i mean our method is really geared to exploit subgroups i mentioned the example of so5 which uses only 10 of the 16 parameters and that does come into a very nice neat form as a something like a block sphere but s4 with two block spheres sitting on each point but uh, the complete su4 of the two qubit is a very complicated manifold yeah yeah i think yes i understand thank you <laughs> all right uh, we have now a question from uh, marek I want also to comment. So several weeks ago, we also considered with a cycle of uh, papers uh, this problem of Weinerman equation of this ordering mm -hmm. um, with Shimon uh, Hazinski, and then uh, we 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 also made more or less uh, such a decomposition. Um, for arbitrarily algebra so for and what is interesting is that for all classical the algebras this are really what you obtain are ricati equations or matrix ricati equation yes except the special g2 algebra I when see. you have false order okay so this is not so important because g2 okay so it appears from time to time in physics but it's not so important uh, still, the, the 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 form of the equation depends a little bit on, on the on the order you choose among the the this, this factors already. Yes. Because you can yes, always. Yes, absolutely right. The order of the factors also matters. Yes. Yes. So so but 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 the structure is more or less the same for all this equation as you wrote. So right. this right. this for this classical algebra. Thank yeah. you. Well, let me comment on your comment, and when you mentioned G two. You said that it's not that interesting, but on the other hand, G two is of course very interesting for atomic physicists. It's the symmetry of the f electrons, and mm -hmm. uh, since I'm speaking with some people, and Torun has been mentioned, uh, Professor Wyborn there, for instance, for many years, the Polish group has actually done a lot of very interesting work. Besides, of course, the G two already in the Fano and Raka work back in the fifties. So. G2 is definitely a, a very interesting group, but okay, so if the, with some application in physics also, but for our application, which we are here, I would say much more, uh, much more involved, it's, it's not so. But it, it is interesting that this the composition for G2 group does not lead to Riccati equation, but the force order equation. That is very interesting. I was not aware of that. Okay. I will send you the, the, the paper. Thank you. I will appreciate that. Okay, we have one more question from uh, Balakrishna. Uh, Ravi, that was a great yes. talk. Uh, you mentioned the, the manifold S4 of SU4. I thought that uh, the group manifold is a fiber bundle with S7 as the base and SU3 as the fiber. Actually, that is another, you are quite right, Bala. Um, incidentally, this is another very old colleague and friend who's asked the question. You're right, that is yet another way of thinking about it. But uh, there, there is, however, uh, I think there are some subtleties, I can't go into it right here now, but uh, you do involve these Grassmannian elements to get a full picture of the full manifold. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I had in mind, but you're right that this S7, S5 uh, or S, S4 that you just mentioned is another way that people have thought about the full two. And S3 itself, of course, is again a fiber bundle with S3 as the base and- right. uh, Right. Whatever. Is five as the base and S three as the fiber. Right. Or S U two as the fiber. Okay. Okay. Thank you so 